the next part we have on, on the agenda, Professor Eva Harris and Professor Lisa Barcelos have led a uh, you know, large scale serology st study in humans uh, in the Bay Area. Um, really one of the first groups who were picking up a very important question as, as we think back to the beginnings of the pandemic when we were like, uh, every, you know, streets were empty and everybody was asking how many actually have this already and or how many had it already and it turns out we have we had no good answer um, and this is where Lisa and Eva came in um, and undertaking a heroic effort in doing a very large serology study well done serology study here in the Bay Area so um, if you don't know them uh, Professor Eva Harris uh, is, a, is in the division of infectious diseases and also director of the Center for Global Public Health in the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley and has been studying molecular virology pathogenesis and you know, really one of the uh, co of virology experts we have on campus. She works on dengue, Zika, and other pathogens, uh, very nasty <laughs> pathogens. So um, has a BSL-3 lab also. So a uh, really great person to spearhead the work in Berkeley around coronavirus and also has uh, received a MacArthur Award um, for her work. And then Professor Lisa Barcelos, also a you know, key person in uh, the Department um, of Public Health in the School of Public Health, professor of epidemiology um, there, also works on computational biology um, and um, has been in the Bay Area for a long time, already training at UCSF and Berkeley. And she is a, a genetic epidemiologist, also very interested in the spread of um, pandemic and COVID uh, in the population. So really great power team and I'm looking forward uh, to, to the talk and hear about the study and the barriers that were faced and what we can learn for the future. Thank you. So um, we're gonna do, a, I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna do a remote attempt here. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go to the top here and um first i'm going to just share this and then lisa's going to take the con uh, remote control so, i'm going to try anyway um yeah i'm actually going to just share my desktop because that's uh what i always do and i know it works <laughs> so um can you see that lisa yes can you try the yeah, we can. the remote story and then i will approve it yeah it's not allowing me Oh, really? Yep. Okay. It just says I'm viewing your screen. Um, oh, wait, here we go. Got it now. Okay. You should have it now. So I'm going to set the, I'm going to just go into here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I will try here. So, Julia, thank you for that introduction and for inviting. Um, Eva uh, and I and me to come here today and to give this presentation. This um, just make sure this works. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, what we're going to do is give a brief description of that study that you mentioned, uh, the UC Berkeley School of Public Health East Bay COVID nineteen study. And while we're going to present a brief summary of results, this uh, is not meant to be a, a research talk. Um, we're just uh, responding to the charge that you gave us, which is to really talk about the challenges and the solutions that we identified, and maybe more importantly, uh, be prepared for the next time around, um, what to, to describe what we learned from our study that will help guide pandemic preparedness in the future. So how our study started, <clears throat> uh, I think everybody is familiar with this timeline. Uh, we had December 31st, 2019, when the first COVID-19, oops, somebody. If, so, if, if you yeah. just click, if you, when you click on the screen, it'll go forward. Okay, I can't get it to go back now. Oh. Can you move back? Okay, thanks. Um, so the, the reason for showing this timeline is to just give some sense of how fast things moved with respect to this study. And you can see that 
uh, on March 17th when the Bay Area shelter in place um, order was, was announced. The big questions at that time, there were many, but um, some that were of great interest to us were who is actually getting infected? What, what is the spread like, uh, a sim asymptomatic spread specifically was a big motivator for this study. And then we were also really interested in how the pandemic was going to affect people's lives. So the study objectives are shown here. Uh, the first objective of the study was to investigate health, social, and economic impacts of the pandemic on individuals and families. And we included uh, the, the goal of studying adherence to social distancing practices in the East Bay region that I'll be describing. And then in addition, we had a goal of better understanding the short and long-term prevalence and spread of SARS-CoV-2 in the East Bay communities in order to inform better virus containment measures. And largely to figure out uh, what can we do better next time. So on March 19th, we sent an email to the Committee on Protection of Human Subjects to inform the intent to conduct this study. And we received some FDA guidance at that time. Uh, miraculously, we secured funding. And um, some of the challenges, I think, to, to point out at this stage of the process um, were even just uh, obtaining IRB approval. So the study by design was complex. And I mentioned that we had to interact with the FDA. Um, this turned out to involve many meetings with the FDA and, and very extended meetings that included many people from the UC Berkeley campus in addition to representatives from the FDA. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that was. Um, but it really did take one month um, to get our first approval. And that was one of many to come. But the initial review required addressing about 51 comments. And while this process was extremely necessary to protect human subjects, uh, I've actually spent a, quite a bit of time talking with members of the IRB since then to think about in the future how this process might be improved. And a solution would be for UC Berkeley's CPHS to have an expedited review process. Uh, uh, such, such a process does exist for particular kinds of research now, um, but, but currently, um, for pandemic level research, which is um, what we were doing, uh, the, this protocol of ours went to full committee review. And so I'm sorry about that advanced. I don't know why. Um, so Eva, it's advancing without me and I'm not touching anything. Um, so I'm just gonna, I guess, uh, can you go back please? Yeah, I was, I was going back, but no, it's not letting me either. Tell me when you want to go back to. Yeah, right here. Okay. Um, I think you should move your arrow off the screen. I know that. It, it isn't. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and so one one um, part of an expedited review process would be to include uh, an MD level review. You know, there were so many aspects of this study that required that level of review that maybe um, an ex expedited review process with that kind of expertise early on in the process, including interaction, like a, a really interactive process with the IRB would be helpful. And another um, piece of information that was shared with me by the, the CPHS folks on campus who are extraordinary and worked really hard to get our study approved um, would be adding um, highly, strained, uh, highly trained staff. And, and so that was, um, this is kind of, you know, something to really think about for the future because I know other institutions had this set up and um, this, this could actually really help move research quickly into action. So uh, just to point out, um, the study started uh, recruiting participants in May. So it was a pretty fast turnaround in spite of um, you know, the difficulties getting things rolling. And the study design overview included uh, targeting all households, which was 309,000 households in 12 East Bay cities. So this was a total of 31 zip codes um, across Contra Costa and Alameda counties with a goal of producing a representative sample of about 5,500 households to do further studies. 
both data collection and at home SARS-CoV testing, which we're going to talk about um, in detail. And the goal of the study was to do this in a longitudinal fashion. So, you know, approximately every two to three months, we'll refer to this as rounds um, as we go forward. And so we mailed these we mailed postcards that we designed um, to all of these households. And this was our screening phase. And the goal here was uh, to recruit one adult per household randomized by birthday within the home. We uh, also sent out 60,000 postcards in addition to the initial round of 309,000 um, in Spanish. And um, both of those postcards are shown here, the front side of them. And then we created uh, all of our study materials uh, and the website in both English and Spanish versions. And then we created flyers in several other languages. And we worked um, very hard on outreach. Um, this, all of this had to be done remotely, which was a major challenge. And we included uh, high schools and you can see a list here, including community-based organizations and um, businesses and so forth, including city government. And as we had a, a very strong and still do social media presence. And then we established a communications team. So all of that happened um, very fast as part of this screening phase. And just to give people an idea of how this worked, the first row of this slide shows the process for screening, um, screening all of these individuals with a very short questionnaire um, and then um, uh, in uh, randomly selecting approximately, and I'll describe that, um, eligible, par eligible participants to then proceed to the main study, which involved collecting much more extensive survey information as well as biological samples. So just to give you ideas of numbers quickly, uh, about 16,000 people responded, um, 14,000 completed the screening questionnaire, and we had a, an initial study um, sample of about 7,200 individuals. Um, the, those individuals were identified by, um, it was a random, a random sample, but what we did is we upweighted. So we included all individuals who identified as Hispanic, Latinx, all non-whites, and then we randomly sampled the rest of the um, individuals to, to be white so that we could really increase the representativeness of our sample. And then, um, as you can see here, the main study involved um, completing additional um, survey questions and then providing uh, uh, samples, which we're going to talk about, um, including a blood sample, um, a swab sample, and a saliva sample. And so each round of the study, and we are just completing the third round of this study, involved over 5,000 individuals, anywhere from um, five thousand to 55 5600 individuals each round that is a very fast uh, review just to give you the basic idea of the study we used the red cap um, secure data platform uh, to collect data and i'm not going to go through all of the questions that we collected but this was a collaboration with ucsf um, and i'll talk about why um, why that was. So I just want to hit some challenges here because there were many uh, related to recruitment and data collection. And what we learned, maybe not so surprising, but this is really a situation that, that we were in, is that it was very difficult to recruit in high-risk communities. And there were reasons um, for this. Uh, our flyers that went out, the postcards that I showed you were likely discarded. Um, there was a there was and is still um, a fear of COVID-19 and testing in general, especially during the time we were getting this study rolling, any stigma potential uh, that was associated with that. And as part of our study, we um, we included in our protocol reporting to the California Department of Public Health any positive virus test results, and that may have been you know a reason that people. Uh, didn't participate particularly in high-risk communities. I think some other limitations uh, is that uh, include that we um, needed people to have access to wireless or, or internet um, for data collection. So they had to have a smartphone um, or a computer. And um, we had difficulties accessing the UCB mail services and the nonprofit rate. Eventually that was worked out, but that actually did um, take some time. Um, so some solutions to this study, to these study challenges, 
um, definitely include uh, using in-person recruitment when possible. It just wasn't something that we could do uh, at the time because of shelter in place. However, um, there are ways that could be done. Um, if we had, for example, additional highly trained staff at the time, which that was not possible, but this would be a solution, um, which could then um, facilitate additional outreach to really hard to reach regions of the East Bay. Um, more involvement of community leaders, community-based organizations. Um, those would be things that would, ha would have helped, but we also did <clears throat> have all of uh, the language study material, postcards, website, our instructional videos, um, in Spanish, and so we do think that that did help. Um, the REDCap license that for the software that we used was not available at UC Berkeley at the time, so there was a lot of additional time taken to work with investigators at um, UC San Francisco to put that into place, but thankfully now that is here at Berkeley. So I'm just going to quickly say just a few things here. Um, the participation in the study was um, highest in zip codes closest to Berkeley. You can see here's a, the geographic region that I mentioned, and you can see by color um, the response rates from each household. This is from the screening phase of the study. And more women um, and middle and older aged adults participated in the study. And I think for the couple of slides that are coming, um, just to point out that this pink bar here, um, this, this is the American um, community survey data. So this is uh, data that are collected on a regular basis about population data and housing data. So we'll use this as, as a reference. And this, um, this is kind of what the, what the numbers are in the area that we were studying. And so then you can see how um, the distribution of individuals in our study here by age compare to the ACS data. So screening um, is, is blue, that was the initial. Um, collection of data and then you can see at least in this slide uh, rounds one and round two and so that you can see that we were fairly close um, to that distribution but you can see that we had some uh, older individuals. Um, I just want to point out um, some a strength was uh, the two-stage sampling that I did describe the screening and then the starting um, moving into the actual study. Um, we did this to improve the diversity in our sample and so again here the pink bars um, represent ACS, and then blue is the screening. And what you see in every case with the data that are here is what we did um, is try to move for rounds one and two shown here closer to the ACS by over and under sampling um, our, our um, study participants. And so that was a big um, effort for this study. And that was um, made possible by doing this two-stage sampling to get population representativeness as close as we could. Last few things to say, not surprising that uh, the social health and economic impacts of the pandemic, even um, across the East Bay in our study sample, um, have been pretty substantial. Um, I won't go through all of these. You can read them and you can see certainly that lifestyle behaviors um, and economic um, loss were very, very apparent in our sample. And I think I will highlight here though, um, that the percent of participants um, who partic uh, um, were sc uh, screened in our study for depression is really high. Um, so the, this is, you know, it's a rough comparison to make, but if you look just even across the US, you're looking at maybe a 6%, um, you know, in general uh, prevalence of depression. And you can see that um, depression was higher during the pandemic in our study sample, especially in individuals who reported um, self-identified as two or more uh, races. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, one goal of the study was to estimate an adjusted population prevalence um, of, of antibody positivity. Um, these are the results across our study area. The over overall prevalence was um, just a little over 1%, which was similar to what the blood banks were reporting at this very same time. I'm showing you data from, you know, just before the end of last year. Um, you can see though, and by looking at this uh, legend here, um, that um, higher Spanish speaking regions across the Bay had a higher prevalence of previous infection. And so that was up, you know, as high as 2.5. All right, the last thing that I'll talk about is just a, um, a, some more behind the scenes related to challenges and solutions which is the topic for today. 
I mentioned earlier that our, our study uh, design included the collection of biological samples. And so we needed a sample um, for which we could do testing for coronavirus. We also wanted uh, an additional sample that would allow us to have material for genome sequencing, um, the, both uh, viral sequencing as well as DNA sequencing from, from the study participant, and then also serology. So all three of these were key to doing uh, to achieving the study goals. And so our testing protocol for SARS-CoV-2 ended up being what I'm going to describe here, which is we collected nasal swabs. Um, those were sent to the study participants from UC Berkeley. We had them returned to our collaborating partners at University of Minnesota Genomics Center for testing using um, the very gold standard, the QRT P uh, PCR protocol. And we did this because we wanted to have the, the results returned to participants within a few days. We wanted the results to be actionable. And as you'll hear, um, there were many challenges with our first pass at trying to do this um, that we ended up addressing. Um, with this protocol. So first of all, though, one of the challenges for doing this was sample collection. So there was a big debate at the time. People can probably remember uh, what, what, what collection uh, mode is best. So we considered many oral swabs, nasal swabs, and nasal swabs we had considered two types, um, and also saliva. And I will spare everyone all the details, but I will say that this took some time to work out given what was happening at the time in the field and that a lot of details were still unknown. Uh, there were debates about how, if we went with a swab, was, would it be collected in preservative? Would it be collected as a dry swab? And remember, all of this is being done at home. And there are a lot of issues related to both of these types of collection. There was a huge scarcity of supplies. Everyone was aware of that, and that impacted our study as well. And then there were layers and layers of approval discussions, approval, more discussions, approval that were needed related to the sample collection protocol that involved the FDA, the EHS at Berkeley. Of course, this all relates to getting your BUAs in place, and then all goes back to the CPHS as well. I know there's a lot of acronyms, but everybody knows what those are. Um, so this, these were big challenges. Um, other challenges were that uh, it became clear that we had to work with collaborative partners and a lot of the potential partners had their, their specific laboratory protocols that they were willing to use for this study, which had trickle down effects on exactly what you would send in an at, in an at home collection kit. Um, I think the density restrictions that were in place that you'll hear more about uh, in Stanley Hall really impacted processing kits and the turnaround time for the testing and results. Um, so the solution, what the solutions are listed here. Um, we did end up going with the nasal swab. It was the safest, it had the highest sensitivity, and we did use a collection tube with preservative. And that, of course, was a, was a big debate, but it turned out to be um, a really good decision. Um, what we ended up having to do was a, um, create a division of labor due to the density restrictions, which meant that we sent our kits directly to University of Minnesota. And that resulted in significantly uh, increased and unexpected costs. So this, this was probably one of the biggest challenges of many. Um, for this study. So I'll hand over to Eva, who's going to take us through um, the last sample type and the challenges there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, awesome, Lisa. So I'm going to, again, this is like a funny talk to give because it's kind of more about the process and the results, but that's, again, what Julia had charged us with. So I'm going to charge ahead. Um, so, so you can imagine we were, we really wanted to see the, um, over time, the level, uh, the imprint of the virus um, infection, which would be in terms of antibodies, which is of course called zero surveillance. And, and, and what we wanted to do um, was not only to have it in a cross-sectional manner, but longitudinal. 
Um, and so there was a lot of ways that we initially envisioned this, but because of the shelter in place and a million different aspects, we had like iterations and iterations. And again, I'm not gonna bring you through all of this, but it started with, we we're gonna do venous blood collection because that's, you know, you, you get serum or plasma and you have really nice clean data. Um, and it's all, you know, we could validate that really very quickly. Um, and, uh, but so we had this idea, you know, was it gonna be through parking lots and drive-throughs? Um, but then shelter in place and we didn't want to have any issues and then we had this we had a whole system worked out with the tank center and um, the director Anna Hart was wonderful and we worked really you know closely to define a, a system that would work that fit into their protocols but are we going to then we thought well no we're going to do it door to door we had this whole story but the deal was that you know we had to do it with the same participants over time for longitudinal results and so um, having people come come to a place it, it's much better if you can go to their home um, and so we ended up with this idea of settling on self-collection kits that were going to be mailed. Um, and of course, there, you know, again, there's some issues with that, but we move it with that. And then the next one was what is, how are we going to collect this blood? Um, and so if it's not going to be venous, it has to be essentially a finger prick. Um, and then there's various variations on a theme that you can imagine through that. And we found these really cool little capillary tubes, um, these micro retainer tubes, and I got really good at them. <laughs> But the first time was a disaster. And what the problem is that, you know, when we beta test, it was a pretty, it was, it, it, you can do it very one or two or three times through and then you get it right. But we were really worried that we would get like something completely unusable back. Um, and essentially you just, you, you can bleed right into a little capillary and there's anticoagulants and then you, you spin it, et cetera. But the problem is that if someone screws up, then it messes up your whole study. Um, and so even though we, it looked very promising at the end, we decided to go with this tried and true dry blood splats, which is something that you know has been we had been using for many years in our work in Nicaragua and also um, with Josefina Colomo, who's very much part of this team with all of her work in Ecuador. Not and so we we have a, you know very good history with dry blood spots. Um, although I have to say that we're used to dealing with arboviruses, flaviviruses, and the antibody responses are much more potent um, than in coronaviruses. So that was kind of a scientific uh, learning curve as well as to deal with coronavirus antibodies and their longevity. Um, but it's essentially there's less blood overall, it's easier to store, it's cost efficient, and it's very easy for participants to do at home or so we thought. Um, but of course the problem was that at the time, none of the SARS-CoV-2 serological assays had been evaluated with, the, with dry blood spots. And actually there's much more variation than we initially anticipated. So I'm just gonna take you through what this ended up with. So these kits were unbelievable and really like shout out to Lisa and her crew for putting this whole story together. And um, so, and, and we had really beautiful um, presentation of all this, but there was a saliva collection kit, a swab collection kit with all of these different parts, um, a blood collection kit, um, you know, and even though it was very, you know, kind of simple conceptually, it actually ended up with all these different pieces. And so it had to be, in, you know, tested and something that the, the, the in-home or the at-home user could deal with um, and be able to send it properly back, et cetera. Um, and, and if you can just some of the visions of what this looked like up in um, Stanley Hall was just, you know, this army of uh, undergrads initially, but then of course through density restrictions ended up being um, really challenging because you know these all had to be put into the boxes and it was at least 5,500 per round. Uh, and so that all sounds like nice because, oh yeah, you'll get good numbers and isn't that nice, lots of zeros at the end. But in reality, uh, it's actually just, just huge numbers of kits that need to be made. And a lot of this you know, had to be done and actually received back and in, in biosafety hoods, et cetera. So it was, you know, it was an incredible task. Um, we did a whole series of, of, of videos. Um, one of the students who worked with uh, Lisa Allison did this beautiful set of videos that we you know, tested over and over about how to do every piece of this. And, 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 and Josefina and her daughter did a huge amount of translation into Spanish. And so at the end of it, um, you know, we had these three rounds um, and because of the cost issues, uh, we actually had to go from five to three rounds um, because of the fact that you know, all of these different elements needed to be included. Um, so the original design, so just, I want you to just remember this little blue ball here <laughs> because it's going to get more complicated. Our original design um, was that, you know, the Barcelos lab was going to be sending the kits and receiving the samples and then passing them on to our lab. This is just for the serology piece. Um, the participants just went back and forth with the Barcelos lab. Um, 
we had, you know, very quickly gotten our hands on the plasmids had, 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 in my own lab had just expressed the, the proteins that we needed and had validated the, the assay. And this is Marcus Wong, who uh, really led that effort. So it was all going to be kind of self-contained. And we set this up during the shelter in place when everyone was back, you know, working on COVID and, you know, the cost was what it had, you know, a certain amount. Um, so what we did really quickly, and I'm not going to belabor this, but we, um, through Florian Kramer's group, who we work with anyways, um, and uh, and also Aubrey Gordon's group at, UC at University of Michigan, we're able to um, get uh, holds of the plasmid, make the spike and the, and, and the RBD, and then through really nice collaborations with Ben Pinsky at Stanford and Brian Greenhouse at UCSF, we were able to um, get uh, the, the samples that we needed for the negatives as well as for positives, which were RTPs are confirmed hospitalized cases and community uh, cases as well. And we set up the, and validated the, the, the ELISA that was going to initially be with serum. But as we mentioned, we were then transferred over to the dry blood spot. And so, you know, there's issues because you have a limited sample volume and a dilution factor and you can have higher background. Um, so everything needed to then be validated for dry blood spots, which um, um, it sounds like, oh, well, no problem, just do, go ahead and do that. But, you know, there's only so many people at the time that we knew who were positive for COVID. And so we had to, to go through this whole kind of reconstitution of, dry, of blood in order to make the dry blood spots to use. And we were wonderfully helped along by um, Mike Bush, who was at Vitalant and Mars Stone and a, a whole group of people who've been working at the forefront of the blood banks in the country. Um, and they were incredibly helpful for figuring out all of, you know, how to go forward. And so we were able to recreate um, the dry blood spots and then uh, to then validate the system that we had worked out for plasma against the dry blood spot, which is here on the Y and the X axis respectively. Um, and so we, you know, you can see that this is just an example, the, ne the pre-2020 negatives and then how they correlated for positives and had a very nice sensitivity and specificity of 97, 98% and specificity of 100%, et cetera. So that was all ready to go. And I'll just note now um, what, what happened is it just took a while because of all of these issues. And so we, the actually the rounds went further along in time than we had initially anticipated. And during that time, vaccination came in. And of course, what happens with vaccination is um, that it's going to um, obfuscate or confound, of course, the detection of natural infections if you're using spike because the vaccination will have spike antibodies and so will the natural infections. And we actually were using spike um, as what our kind of uh, antigen of choice. Um, so then we pivoted and um, incorporated a nucleocapsid um, of serology as well, uh, because only the natural infections um, are going to have antibodies to the N or the nucleocapsid because um, it's the entire virus, whereas the vaccination is just spike. Um, so then to do that, we had to create a new set of reconstituted blood, and then we validated an in-house analyzer um, with really nice you know, sensitivity and, and so the specificity. And then we also had an algorithm with the spike and the N together. Um, and then we had to go and revalidate the dry blood spots with that, which we did again for both N and for S alone a little bit of a drop in sensitivity, but still um, very usable and um, high specificity. So this is just showing you some of the, you know, now we have the analyzer um, and so we've got the plasma and then we've also done it for the dead blood spots and, you know, everything's fine and good and we have our toolkit. Um, so that was the serology piece. So we're ready to go. Now what happens when you say, oh, you know, this should be really easy these cute little cards and you bleed just onto each one of these little um, dry blood spots um, and they're easily taken off, um, but they're kind of presented as this little flower. But, but in fact, what you get back is all kinds of stuff um, from our 5,000 some participants. Um, and so we had to come up with, you know, we do a, a quality control score so that we could actually monitor because of course the amount of blood in each spot is going to influence how much antibody. So we need to be controlling for how much blood there is in addition um, to what the actual titer of the antibody is in each sample. Um, so then we came up with this great uh, little business card, uh, which actually turned out to be very helpful um, and, and a lot of um, kind of interaction or more detail about how to collect the samples. And this helped a lot with the quality of the dry blood spots that we get back. And I just mentioned this because in the future, we actually think that dry blood spots is a very good way to do serious surveillance during a pandemic. Um, and so now kind of all of this blood and gore that I'm bringing you through with all of the details um, is actually very useful because we think that it's actually a viable way and this actually helped a lot. Um, one of the big issues, however, that came up um, was because of these density restrictions um, that massively limited personnel, um, again, not at the beginning when we were all working on COVID, but once research came back, 
we could only bring 25% of our entire labs and that cut dramatically into the COVID work that we were doing. Um, and so not only on the kit preparation, but on the serology, because initially we were just gonna plow through this on my own in my lab since we had it all set up. But beca because we, we were not able to bring people in um, and I would, you know, argue that in the future, um, and because of hiring freezes, we ended up having to outsource the serology to an industry partner, which ended up increasing the cost a lot. And also, we had to have kind of a whole factory set up for being able to just process, I call it the spots and dots, which was just taking the spots and the dots, the, the dry blood spots and putting them into tubes in order to send them to our processing center. Um, so now this got more complicated. So you know, remember we were all in this little nice blue spot in the beginning, but now we have the samples coming here and then we have them going to our, our, our partner um, CTS, which is gonna be doing a high throughput system and then it comes back, et cetera. And so this of course has increased the cost because now we're, uh, we're outsourcing. Um, and then we had to set up this the whole uh, CTS to be able to use dry blood spots because in fact, although um, we worked with ortho clinical diagnostics on their vitreous, um, uh, this is this called the, the, the um, uh, it was a total IG called the vitreous um, system that they had worked out and they got, you know, immediate, very quick EUA approval with sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 100%, but that was for plasma, not dry blood. So we actually worked very closely with the chief scientific officer, the CSO and his team at Ortho and the blood testing system for the entire US, which is for where we were working at CTS and Mike Bush. So, and we still have weekly calls. So it was a really intense um, whole process for moving this system into processing dry blood. Um, and and dry blood spots, and so we ended up with doing a whole validation with them um, with a sense of a lower sensitivity than we had initially expected. And it turns out that even though um, this is a high throughput commercial system, it's actually more sensitive to dilution than the little in-house ELISAs are. Because little in-house ELISAs, what you do is you always just do a one in a hundred dilution of your serum, for instance, because that's the way the system is set up. So it's actually better for dilution in an ELISA, um, but of course it's better for high throughput in this kind of a system. And then when, when the end came along, we had to do the entire thing all over again, um, this time with a Roche total IG and assay, which would do nuclear capsid antibodies at CTS and then, um, and then the same thing around. So what happened is that when we sent everything off, um, the first set of round one that came back, we were kind of concerned because even though there was a really, really good separation for plasma between positive and negative, when we did the dry blood spots, we noticed if you see here, this is on the y-axis, the signal to noise ratio essentially. Um, and what we see here, if you just look um, at this point, is that the one, the, the one is supposedly the cutoff. Um, but you can see that the negatives and the positives, they actually you know, go right over one. And so therefore this indeterminate range is there's not a huge separation anymore between negative and positive. So we were concerned about that and we decided to reflex anybody that was in this indeterminate range back to our lab for back to the ELISA as we had initially planned. Um, so then we had this whole you know, reflex testing that we had to do. And then, um, then as it got more complicated because we had, couldn't do with the density restrictions, the turnaround time, as Lisa mentioned. So we ended up having to outsource you know, to first for kitting and then also outsourcing to um, University of Minnesota for receiving the samples. So in the end, this is what it looked like. <laughs> so when we started, it was just this nice blue circle. And now this whole complicated system set up, which actually we now have a really nice throughput, um, but you can, you know, as, but this is kind of what we had to do, uh, you know, as the time was going forward, going on kind of in real time um, to incorporate all of the different pieces that happened. And of course the cost went up because fundamentally of the density restrictions that were happening at the time um, to our initial plan for how to go about this. Um, so the next time around, and this is kind of where I'm gonna um, wrap up, um, is that in terms of research facilitation, um, it, you know, and again, this is less glamorous than Jana's talk, uh, but really, you know, it's totally possible to do whatever we put our minds to, um, but we feel like it would be really useful at Berkeley, um, UC Berkeley, you know, and we're happy to work on this together, could have a, a plan that prepares researchers to perform studies that, that, that they become funded to do on the next pandemic while maintaining safety, of course. Um, but we think that there would have been, you know, there's definitely possible ways to maintain that safety um, and enable space allocations, um, 
you know, not, you know, enormous amounts of hiring, but just what you need to get through the research that was funded. Um, as Lisa mentioned, an expedited CPHS protocol approval system um, or you know, for pandemic um, use, and then um, streamlining purchasing and vendor approvals and campus admission support would be incredible during pandemics because we can't tell you how much this really slowed everything down and was something which really should be something that we can handle and, and it's not at all you know related to safety it's just in terms of streamlining um, and of course you know this led to a whole you know a lot of tensions because we weren't able to go as fast as we had promised our donors and of course attention between the research that we were supposed to do and you know this is like you know my lab took on maybe three or four projects around COVID and many people around the campus did as well um, and so I think that there's a lot that we could do to facilitate the research here um, and the other thing that's really important that we think that comes out of this which is more content oriented is really that serious surveillance is critical and it, it's kind of a no-brainer if you think about case-based reporting which is what you see in the New York Times and everything every day is very different where the cases are and where what population those cases are in versus where the infection is. And if you want to talk about an, a pandemic and understanding transmission, you need to talk about infection and not only cases. And it turns out that just in, in addition, um, in our work in Nicaragua, where I've been working for many decades, um, we actually have a number of really interesting study, which it has, you know, initially was on several arboviruses, um, which has very much to do with the spatial um, and kind of the inapparent, uh, in, inapparent to symptomatic ratio of a number of what could be pandemic diseases, as well as their spatial distribution. Um, and we have a study right now that that compares um, a huge like SAR, um, the, the SARS. CoV-2 epidemic right now, COVID-19 in Nicaragua in our study site, and also uh, a Zika epidemic and two chikungunya, which are mosquito-borne viruses. And we see the same thing, which is that there's a large variation, as we know, um, in the symptomatic to inapparent ratio. And spatially, that ratio is not distributed uniformly. And what we find is that the clustering um, actually happens of the infection. So spatially, it's the infection that is clustered, not the cases. And so when you think about this, it's kind of obvious, but we actually, you know, have data from, you know, in Nicaragua, and you can certainly imagine that in the United States, that if you were looking at nursing homes and schools, you know, you would see, oh, there's transmission, for instance, if I'm looking at cases in the nursing homes, but I won't see the transmission in the schools. And so then your interventions are going to be very biased and you're going to miss doing interventions that can actually stop the transmission with, you know, of the of the disease, I mean, you know, of the virus and then the disease. And so it's really, really important. The only way that you can actually follow the transmission is through infection. And the way that you can follow infection is through zero surveillance. And how you can follow do zero surveillance during a pandemic is with at home collection. And we think that we've kind of put this, you know, and we're not the only ones, but we were definitely actually in the forefront um, of going through all of this rigmarole to be able to use dry blood spots in the home because they just hadn't been validated. And now, you know, we've actually worked with ortho and they, the, the CSO is actually really excited about in the next time around um, doing a use case for, you know, both R&D and EUA emergency use of approvals for dried blood spots in their commercial assays. So uh, we just talked to him last week and in and, and, and our weekly calls and he said, absolutely, that's something that they want to do in the future. Um, and, you know, from show and then actually the, the, the California Department of Public Health is currently doing a, a statewide surveillance, zero surveillance um, survey using dried blood spots and a lot of the information that we've been able to share. Um, so I think that, you know, allowing, you know, the personnel to process in-house ELISAs is actually very useful and we actually now, you know, kind of understand better um, what kinds of antibodies are detected when you do a capture like IgG ELISA kind of format and the sandwich formats, which some of the um, commercial tests are using that some, the sandwich format is actually better for um, the uh, persistent antibodies. Um, but the IgG captures actually um, correlate really well with neutralizing antibodies, which actually decline over time. So through this and through our work with Mike Bush and his work, um, we've actually gotten really important understanding of what kinds of assays measure what kinds of antibodies. Um, and that will be very useful for the future. And so um, now just to, to finish off our talk, um, there's uh, the just some of the round three results are really interesting because our self-reported vaccination status in February was 44% of our population. Um, and, and just to show you, in, this is just some of the data 
we're not finished and I'm not going to give you percentages, but I just want to show you that, that the anti-spike antibodies, you know, increase with time and dose as you would expect. So you can get real biological information from the dry blood spot um, that's even quantitative. And you can see here, for instance, this is in green after a first dose and then after in a second dose in purple. And you can see that it goes up over time. Um, and of course, between the first and the second dose. Another interesting um, observation over here is just that um, the, you know, after the first dose in pink and the second dose in turquoise, um, of course, this is just, again, on the y-axis, the, um, the signal from the ortho assay. And you can see that over age, um, we definitely have lower levels, especially after the first dose. This is, you know, the lower levels of antibody in people of higher age, which again is something we would expect, but it just shows that you can get biological meaningful information from the dry blood spots. So in summary, we designed and implemented a, a, a large COVID-19 study um, in two months um, with a huge team and a multidisciplinary effort. Um, but uh, then uh, antibody prevalence in our study sample was actually very low. Um, and because in the Bay Area, it was actually very low, especially in the population that we were able to a sample and that was very similar to what the health departments and the blood banks um, were reporting but you could see even in our distribution that there was giant variation by zip code by geography and by socioeconomic um, status and demographic and you could see that the spanish-speaking areas were um, and the, the lower income areas were where there was the highest uh, transmission um, as you know we had expected but we can reflect that through this kind of a study um, we also saw that participants lives were changed dramatically with many unanswered questions about future health economic and social impacts and we can actually look at you know the the, the kinds of mitigation strategies that they employed and how that affected um, their positivity rates. Um, we overcame many challenges that we spent probably too much time talking about, but that was what Julia asked. Um, and we hope that these will guide preparation for future pandemics. And we feel that at-home collection of dry blood spots is viable and feasible for longitudinal zero surveillance. Um, so we're currently completing round three, tracking our antibody status during the vaccination rollout. Um, so we're finding our statistical models, analyzing the data, and, and we're posting our results on our sites if you're interested. Um, a bunch of manuscripts being pulled together, and if you're interested, these are the sites to follow us. And a, an incredible team to thank um, all of the folks in, in Lisa's laboratory um, and a whole team of amazing um, UCB undergrad volunteers, a number of people in my laboratory listed here, others from the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, uh, Joseph Lunard, Nick Jewell, William Dow, and Sean Wu, um, and then our teams at the University of Minnesota, at CTS, at Ortho, at Vitalant, um, the Biohub, um, Brian Greenhouse at UCSF, at Stanford, University of Michigan, and a really amazing funding that came through, you know, in the first month or two and have been like very supportive of this work. And we really want to thank everybody. So that's where I'm going to end. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you for amazing talk. I mean, really, you know, I have like a whole bag of questions, some of which I'm going to keep for the panel discussion, but this is uh, really a heroic effort. And I, I love how you showed um, also what was really needed to make this happen, you know, because you think zero surveillance, like conceptually, you know, but it's, it's straightforward, but it's not. Right? I mean, look at all these technological innovations that you had to make happen and how to work with all the stakeholders. I mean, amazing. I mean, really amazing, amazing work. Um, and I, I think one thing I want to highlight just for the audience more as a comment, not so much as a question, is that, um, you know, there's also been, I think, really a lack of coordination on the sero serological studies, right? I mean, you went out there and you just did it. And I mean, looking at all the difficulty to actually make it happen, and I mean, everything is an uphill battle. Um, so many people also say, you know, why don't you just drop it? You know, for sure, other people must be doing this. Isn't somebody else in charge? I mean, I remember this hearing this a lot early in the pandemic where people doubt everybody's project because clearly somebody else should be really running this uh, in a more coordinated fashion. But I really want to applaud you to keep going and doing this because now we get this real time data as people get vaccinated and it's really great to see. It's almost like a phase four study <laughs> we're doing on the efficacy of the vaccine. And you know, we would have never been able to get this had you not persevered through all these difficulties and make it make it happen you know so i think great great actual leadership yeah I, we need more of that on all levels people taking charge and doing what they can are positioned to do 
instead of waiting for some other unknown entity to to actually do this work. So I think that that's that's something um, we sometimes take for granted, but it's it's really great to see true leadership, you know, coming from Berkeley um, and this area. Um, for, for zero surveillance because it's critical. And another thing that I see in your talk is, I mean, you're clearly doing research of national importance and in a, in a national crisis. And this come back, comes back to what we talked about this morning with Janet and Harold about treating this research, you know, more along, you know, a de department of defense lines, if you really think about it. And um, somehow that hasn't translated, I, I think, to the UC system with, um, for example, the, the delays and deadlines that were still there, um, because you, this kind of research you should should have been, you know, red carpet should have been rolled out on all levels, you know, because clearly it's national importance. I mean, why do we worry about, um, you know, even IRB, I think, you know, why do we still have that standard uh, set so high? I mean, you're not really experimenting surgically with people with untested techniques. I mean, you're doing a very non-invasive, completely voluntary study. So, so I, to me that it's like we, we kind of overcautious in some ways, you know, um, particularly around coronavirus, I think would benefit from a, a more national leadership saying we're changing the rules a bit, uh, anything that doesn't really involve significant risk for the participants, we, we're just going to relax a bit. Um, but that hasn't happened. So I, I think uh, kudos to you for persevering through all this, but um, we need to reframe this kind of research more as, uh, you know, critical insights for, you know, national security, because ultimately decisions need to be made based on the findings of your studies, like on the local level, on the state level, um, lockdown decisions, all these have really a lot of impact very, very wide reaching impacts and we need the data. So there is a, is a real vested interest in getting good quality data and it conflicts with all these um, somewhat, you know, overzealous implementation of rules <laughs> that, that, that I see. So yeah, I'm, I'm stopping there. I'm stopping myself there. Um, some questions from the audience. Um, what were your primary monitoring and evaluation methods utilized during this project? to ensure validity. I'm not sure if you mean, if it was just on the serological level, I mean, at any rate, it was, um, you know, the every time, essentially this validation, kind of standard validations of any assay that you would do, you know, first for the plasma and then for DBS with, you know, a, a hundred negatives and a whole series of positives and, rec you know, reconstituting the dry blood spots and um, to be able to do those validations as each, you know, new assay uh, and whatever came along, you know, that we had to kind of deal with. I'm not sure if that's what you mean, um, but that's kind of the validation of the methods at any rate. Um, and then we were, had weekly calls with um, Mike Bush and his team at Vitalant and actually the whole system and, and, and they kind of had their finger on the pulse of what was going on in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also in the entire country we're receiving you know daily and weekly reports of the positivity rates and so we were very squarely within what was being you know reported at the what they were finding at the um, blood bank level which is kind of more the population that we were probably in the end um, reflecting to, to some degree and so we were you know reassured that what we were getting from our at least at the ser serological level was very reflective of what was going on in the bay area at that time um, including the vaccination rollout as well. Um, so that was, I don't know if that answers your question, Sloan, um, or if, Lisa, if you have any other, to, anything to add to that. And then Wayne is asking um, about uh, sources such as Worldometer, you know, do they underreport the data? Do you have any idea? Yeah, so do you have preliminary results on the extent to which, I mean, I no, I can't say. I, what we do know is how much in our, for instance, in Nicaragua, we have. We can say very how much we have in terms of the ratio between symptomatic and inapparent. For instance, um, in in this study, we weren't following um, symptomatic cases, um, but there is a big, as we know, the this SI ratio again, and then um, you know, so that and that is going to vary. Um, but it, it's difficult to put a number on, you know, because with the worldometer is such a global 
and kind of uh, kind of non stratified number. Um, but it's obviously going to depend on how much like, you know, the age distribution that's you know, in those numbers. And so um, it depends, again, it, it, whether you're thinking about case reporting or whether you want to be talking about reporting infections, you know, which we think is very important as well. Um, and so I, I'm not sure, Wayne, if your question was about the infection or whether there was like the, whether the disease incidents you thought was, you know, being underreported. Now, if you go to Worldometer and places like that, they do break the data down. So you can go to the US and you can go to California yeah. and they're aggregating from other sources. What I'm interested in is the extent to which um, there are a number of maybe even symptomatic cases, but they're not being reported at all. So for example, the main concern is about how we're approaching herd immunity so we're probably much closer to herd immunity than we think we are if we just look at various data reported from cases the cases that come in via standard channels so i'm trying to get a sense between how much we've estimated where we are with regard to herd immunity and where we really are yeah, so then you're not talking about cases, you're talking about actual infections. And so yeah, that's like right. really not being tracked on Worldometer. But, you know, I, th I think the herd immunity, it's also kind of a dangerous concept in the sense of we don't really understand immunity um, to, sorry, to, especially to coronaviruses. Right. Like when I launched this, I was like, oh, I understand virus, flavy viruses. It was very different with coronaviruses because it, there's, you get this waning of antibodies, at least the antibodies that correlate with the neutralizing titers are what wanes apparently, you know, right. over time. And so then, then, and we don't even know exactly how neutralizing antibodies, you know, because there's the different kinds and there's also, obviously there's non-neutralizing and, you know, FC effector functions and all kinds of things. And then T cells, which are very important as well from the work of, um, um, Alex Sete and, and Danielle Mikkelmeyer and others, you know, so it's what, what really is immunity is, you know, is difficult to say, for what we mean by herd immunity, you know, traditionally herd immunity is like how many people just got infected, um, and and there's again. So I think that it's it's um, difficult to a you know from Worldometer figure out what the infection rate. There's no way to extrapolate from those data, um, and also what really constitutes immunity. I think is still a question in the coronavirus field right now, um, and how that goes with time. You know, um, so you know having X Y amount of antibodies in in your blood is not necessarily didn't tell you if you're immune because you can have a wonderful memory B cell response or memory T cell response or et cetera, you know? So it's like, it's very complex. And I think that that's a really important aspect of, you know, what of, of work is understanding what constitutes, you know, immunity. Um, but so just to complicate the things a little more. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the next level is cross immunity to different strains. Yeah. Yes, and that's a whole, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> Julie, how much we could take time here with this. I'll, I will be back in the panel. So um, that would be, you know, definitely, I don't want to Thank you for talking. and such, but you know. Yeah, we, we just skipped the lunch break. Next is, is at 1.50, so you can answer. Well, people probably want to eat and like take a little break themselves. So I'm not, I wouldn't want to like stampede on people's rights. Thank you so much.